Shreyan Sharma. I'm your host for this evening, and I welcome you all to the VJTI's first guest lecture of 2021, conducted by Technomancer. Taking technology to the society has always been the motto of Technomancer, an ardent desire to enlighten young minds and inoculate impeccable qualities within them has been the very objective of the GLS since its inception. The renowned lineup of the guest lecture series. Over the year, has added immense value to the lives of several young minds. We have had pioneers of diverse fields, some of them being Dr. A. P. J. Abdul Kalam, Mr. Ratan Tata, Dr. Kiran Bedi, Mr. Narayan Murthy, Mr. Harsha Bogle, and several others on this platform who have graced Techno Anza with their presence. Today is yet another day when we add a truly inspirational name to this glorious list of remarkable individuals. We are confident that the lecture will instill a new perspective in each one of your lives. Our guest lecturer for today is Dr. Rajesh Parekh. Dr. Rajesh Parekh is Engineering Director at Google, where he leads a talented team focusing on data quality for Google's Geo product. His team applies various machine learning and computer vision techniques to build trustworthy and useful understanding of the real world. He is passionate about solving challenging problems that deliver tremendous user impact. Prior to Google, Dr. Parekh led analytics for Facebook's video and applied machine learning initiatives. Before Facebook, he was the vice president of data science at Groupon, where he built products for personalization, sales automation, and marketing optimization. He also worked at Yahoo Labs building display advertising targeting products. At Blue Martini Software, developing data mining products for e-commerce, and at Allstate, solving insurance problems like cross-sell, retention, and fraud. Dr. Parekh earned his MS and PhD in computer science, focusing on artificial intelligence from Iowa State University. He grew up in India and has completed his BE in computer and engineering from VJTI Mumbai. He has published over 30 research papers, hold multiple international patents. And participates in the machine learning and data science community. So we are truly honored by your presence today. We will have a Q and A session after the lecture. So please leave your questions in the live chat below. So without any further ado, let's be a part of this conversation regarding our shared future under the guidance of clearly the best. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Shreyans, and. Thank you all for attending. It is indeed a great honor and privilege for me to be presenting here uh, at the VJTI Technovanza Forum. I will share my slides, and then we can start the presentation. Yeah, can we make a full view for Rajesh? All right, so I'm going to share with you our story at Google Maps and how we have created a planet-scale playground for computer scientists. Firstly, a very big thank you to Dr. Dhiren Patel, Dr. Rohin Daruwala, various distinguished faculty members, and dear VJTI students. It is a great honor for me to be with you and share my story at Technovanza. I'm extremely humbled to learn about the many illustrious presenters who have graced this forum. Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, Mr. Ratan Tata, and more recently, Vinod Dham, who is the father of the Pentium chip. My education at VJTI has helped me to set the foundations for my further education and professional career. I'm delighted to be back at VJTI today nearly 30 years after I graduated from here. And before I jump in, I want to express a very special thanks to Professor Darwala, who's my mentor and guide, not just from my college days, but in the years since. Thank you, sir, for everything that you've done for me and also for the thousands of students who have studied with you. I'll give you a brief introduction about myself. As Shreyans mentioned, I'm born and brought up in Mumbai. Like most children growing up in Mumbai, I was also interested in cricket. But unlike most students growing up in Mumbai, or most children growing up in Mumbai, I was less interested in becoming a national team player 
but more in giving cricket commentary. I used to love following Sir Richie Bennett, who is one of the great Australian commentators. And of course, this goes back many years, but we used to wake up at three or four in the morning just to follow the India-Australia matches and listen to Richie Bennett give commentary. My undergraduate education was in VJTI. And then after I graduated, I moved from Mumbai, a place of more than 10 million people, to Ames, Iowa, with a population of 50,000 people. The temperatures in Mumbai hardly ever drop below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And the temperatures in Ames, Iowa, in the winter months, often are between minus 30 and minus 50 Fahrenheit with the wind chill. And I still wonder what made me make that jump. But it was a phenomenal time, seven years there at Iowa State University. As I was completing my PhD, I almost thought that I would take up a faculty position. You know, there is some amount of destiny or fate involved, and I ended up with Allstate Research Center. And since then, I've had the opportunity to work with some of the very smart people across the globe at various companies. Currently, I'm at Google. I lead the data quality efforts of Google Geo's products. Over the next few years, and, and maybe after retirement, I would still love, love to get back to teaching. I'll share with you a few thoughts about engineering at Google and then dive into the meat of Google Maps. But since you are all VJTI students, I feel it might be helpful to just get a sneak peek of what life is like at Google. Google's mission has held steadfast over the past 20 years since its founding. The mission is very simple. Organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. You may have read a lot of articles about our principles, about the various benefits, about a lot of the fun that team members at Google have. I want to share with you briefly what it is like to be an engineer at Google. One of the big things we prize at Google is the opportunity to work as part of a team. Our software engineers succeed as a team. They have very open communication, strong collaboration, and very regular tracking of progress. These are the kinds of things that you are already doing as part of your college projects and class projects. And I encourage you to keep this up. The spirit of cooperation and collaboration is something that helps to build products and services that are truly inspirational and can change the world. Writing computer programs in college and making sure that they are ready for prime time is an extremely important aspect that you should consider as you go through your education. Code reviews at Google are mandatory. We have at least one other person who peer reviews your code. We also look for readability. Now, these things may not seem obvious at the start, but when you are maintaining such a large code base and you know that some employees may be on vacation at some point in time, and if a bug comes in, you want other team members to be able to quickly pick up and address that bug. And that's why things that might be seemingly very simple, code reviews or readability, documentation, et cetera, they become extremely crucial in a large scale production environment. Every code change goes through a very rigorous check and the reviews are very critical and constructive. As we code for Google, we have to think about a lot of factors. Is the system able to handle large amount of traffic? Are we able to complete the requests with low latency? Are we co-located with dependent services? What about security, privacy, accessibility for all users, and availability internationally? These are all extremely important questions that we think about as we write the programs. A few things that I want to share Based on my personal experience, here are the four core skills that will help you as part of the 21st century work environment. 
you are already at VJTI, you are working in your respective disciplines, whether it is computer engineering or electronics and electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, you're going to get a lot of depth in your field. And that is great. In addition to that, I encourage you and the faculty members who are on this particular call to think about problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, and communication. These are four very important skills and sometimes neglected as we go through the rigors of our college education. Let me now transition and tell you our story at Google Maps. What you are seeing on the left is an ancient tablet that is dated about the sixth century BC. This tablet represents Babylon at its center and some of the surrounding areas. We believe that this is the first known map to humankind. Now in the 2,400 years since, or 2,600 years since, we have come a long way. Until the better part of the last century, we were all looking at paper maps. With the mobile revolution, and the advances in computer technology, it is incredible that we have the entire world in this small device, our phones, and we have the ability to navigate anywhere in the world. And that is what mapping technology has done for us. It has taken about 2,600 years, but we truly believe that now we have been able to map our planet. We think of Google Maps as a single application, but Maps is actually a shorthand for an incredibly rich knowledge base that is best described as a layer, layer cake. At the bottom layer, we have the basic road network information. On top of that, we have a lot of semantic information that is built in, and then 3D models, and then the knowledge about the local places. Each of these layers you can think of as being updated independently. It becomes very important for us to keep these layers consistent with each other so that we can present a delightful user experience. So you have to think of this multi-layer corpora as being updated every second, but yet independently to present a cohesive experience. You're all familiar with Maps applications. Navigation is one of the best known application of Google Maps. And here, if I want to find directions to go from VJTI to Kalagoda, I just type that in in Google Maps and I can get information about driving, about public transportation, and so on. Additionally, we have information about real-time traffic conditions. That helps us to choose our path and also helps us to alter our path in real time as needed. A fun fact for you, based on our data, we believe that the longest navigable road trip where you can actually drive is from Cape Town in South Africa to Vladivostok in Russia. It's a total of 26,000 kilometers. And just for context, the circumference of the Earth is about 40,000 kilometers. So it is fascinating that if you printed this out, you know, this would be several hundred pages of directions, but you can actually get from one corner of the world to the other in your car. Google Earth is another very interesting application. And if you have not had a chance to play with it, I highly encourage you to download it from the, the Play Store or the App Store and experiment with it. Google Earth is a platform for storytelling. And it is basically a canvas that can be used for interesting research, for articles, and also for news publications. It gives you a fascinating three-dimensional view of the world that you can zoom in and zoom out as needed. You all know that Google is a search company. What you may not know is that a good percentage 
of the searches are actually local in nature. So here is an example of trying to find pizza near me or pizza near a particular landmark. And a lot of these local searches are satisfied by the geo team. We have to think about various dimensions as we satisfy the local searches and present the results to our user. What is the distance from the user? What are the modes of transportation that they might be able to use? What is the category of the search? If I ask for pizza near me or coffee near me, how do I interpret that? And what is the time of the day? Are these places going to be open or closed? That way we can present the most relevant results to our users and help them fulfill their journeys. Google Maps also provides a very interesting tool for exploration and discovery. If I have a few hours to spare in Mumbai, I can use the Explore tab to identify some interesting places that I might want to go for sightseeing or places where I might want to try out you know, my favorite dishes. Map making is extremely hard. And let me tell you why we think that is the case. Our users expect us to be comprehensive, fresh, and accurate. The map should always be available to them. However, the world around us is changing. And last year, we have seen this particularly hard. With the COVID-19 pandemic, the world around us has changed in dramatic ways. A lot of businesses have temporarily closed or, or sometimes even unfortunately permanently closed because of the pandemic. And in weather conditions, in different weather conditions, we may have accidents, temporary road closures, and so on. These are events that need to be reflected very quickly in Google Maps so that when our users search either for directions or for particular places, we are able to provide them with accurate information. We use a variety of techniques to curate our data and keep it fresh and accurate. These include things like web extraction, obtaining feeds from local providers, our own human experts, crowdsourcing technology, and imagery. Now, in the interest of time, I will focus on these last two pieces. Crowdsourcing. Our users help to keep our map up to date. You may not know. But as user of Google Maps, you can actually provide a lot of feedback. We get a, you know, several millions of edits a day. These are made by our users. They edit the map. They provide us information about missing places, potentially missing roads, location attributes, and so on. And it becomes a challenge for our engineering teams to review these updates, publish them quickly, and enable them to go live within minutes of these changes. And if you think about this, Google Maps is used by a billion plus users around the world. This becomes a huge challenge in maintaining distributed systems and keeping them accurate and fresh all the time. One of our big challenges is how do we tell good updates from bad ones? Most of our users are well-meaning. They provide us with accurate updates. However, in some cases, mistakes do happen. Right? They might just be genuine mistakes. Maybe the user did not understand things or did not have a clear idea of the real world change. And in some small cases, there is fraud and then there is vandalism. Historically, almost all of the edits that were presented by our users were evaluated by our human experts. As you can imagine, this does not scale, right? with millions of edits coming in every single day. Over the last several years, we have invested in machine learning technology. And a combination of machine learning and human expertise allows us to stay on top of all of these changes that our crowdsourced users are providing us with. Mistakes do happen despite all of our best efforts. And here is an example. After the 2016 US presidential elections, one of the users went and renamed you know, Trump Tower to Dump Tower. This is extremely unfortunate. The user was clearly frustrated with the election results, 
whatever their political leanings or their emotions, they are impacting the factual data that is that should be correctly available on Google Maps. Now, of course, we were able to spot this correctly, uh, sorry, spot this quickly and fix it and deploy the fix to the millions of users around the world. But these are the kinds of challenges that we have to be extremely careful about. These small mistakes can actually cause a lot of harm to our end users who are looking to us for factually actual, accurate information. So as I mentioned, we need expedient measures. Users may react that there is something incorrect. We actively monitor media outlets. We identify the fix and verify it, make sure that it is the correct one, and then propagate it to all of our product services. The second aspect of collecting data and curating accurate maps information is imagery. One of the most powerful sources that we have for us is Google's Street View imagery. And some of you may have already seen this, and you can see this on Google Maps as well. Google Street View displays a panorama of stitched images. Over the years, we have collected millions of images. These are high resolution images that are available for a lot of places in the world. Collecting Street View is an interesting challenge. And the map right here in the center shows you areas where we have Street View information. We've mounted cameras on cars in places, especially in Southeast Asia, where we have narrow streets where cars might not be able to go through. We've even mounted cameras on these tricycles. In crowded areas where vehicles are not allowed, we have backpack mounted cameras and our trekkers go around to identify uh, or, or to take these images. And then in some cases, we've had cameras on kayaks and snowmobiles just so that we can accurately map every corner of the world. We've also encouraged crowdsourced street view collection. And this is an interesting story I want to tell, tell you. We've had people in the Faroe Islands who heard about the crowdsourced street view imagery collection. And they were so fascinated by it, they wanted to make sure that the Faroe Islands in the North Atlantic have um, all of their roads accurately mapped. Now, obviously, it was very difficult for us to get the car there. But what they did is they mounted cameras on the backs of sheep and walked the sheep along the roads. And so instead of street view, we had sheep view but we were able to map the Faroe Islands all the same. Now, all jokes aside, in seriousness, we believe that the ability to ask questions of the real world, where am I? Where can I get coffee? Can you show me how to get there? Are truly the holy grail of any good mapping application. Machine learning has been a workhorse for our products for the better part of the decade. And more recently, the advances in deep learning paired with these street view imagery has helped us to extract a lot of semantic information across the board, which in turn allows us to solve some of the most fascinating user problems that we face. Street view is more than pixels. As this image shows you, from the images of public places that we have been able to take, we can identify things like street names, street numbers, and therefore geocode or geolocate specific businesses and places. We can identify traffic lights, traffic signs, business names, phone numbers. If there are menus that are displayed on the front of a store or a restaurant, we are able to identify menu items as well. That's the beauty of these street view images. A confluence of multiple technologi technological innovations has helped us to build these kinds of maps over the years. Imaging, the availability of very large label data sets. For those of you who are familiar with machine learning and computer vision algorithms, you know that getting large label data sets is extremely crucial. In the recent years, the availability of computational power and the advances in deep learning, all of these paired together have given us a unique opportunity to understand the physical world. 
I'll spend a few minutes just giving you a couple of examples of how machine learning is used behind the scenes to identify interesting semantic information. So this is an application that detects street numbers for addresses, right? So if I live on 123 Main Street, how do we extract the address 123? We use deep learning neural networks and have perfected some of the multi-stage approaches. The first stage here is to detect, which essentially helps us to identify the various digits. And it says, this is a one or two or three of that one, two, three main street. The second stage is verification. Now you might ask, why do we need this? Keep in mind that the street view images are taken by the street view cars that are driving down the road. And the camera might take images, not just of these house numbers, but also of other numbers that may appear at the back of a bus or on a billboard. And so we need to verify that this is indeed the street number that allows us to capture the addresses. And that's the verification stage. And the last is basically the transcription, right? So once we have detected, then we transcribe the numbers, put them together, and that gives us the addresses. There are still a lot of challenges that we have to deal with in this process. Here is a very interesting example that shows the power of the street view in Lagos. Here's a panel. Now, if I were to ask you, can you tell whether there is a street number here? Even for trained human experts, this is going to be a significant challenge. But the algorithms that were trained were able to correctly detect that the street number was down there below on that wall, and that was 22. And that's fascinating. However, the real world data can be very messy. And here is an interesting example. This is a mailbox where you can see three different numbers. There is 915, there is 15, and there is 95. Now these things will be detected by our algorithms, but which one is the actual street number or the house number? Now this is where we bring additional context to bear. So essentially, if I know that I have seen other house numbers like 909, 921, et cetera, then I have a lot more confidence that I can infer that this particular or the correct house number here is 915. And this is, again, a simple insight that I want you to consider as you go through your problem solving. The challenges that you face require us to think broadly and think about what additional information might we have? What additional clues do we have that help us to make the correct decisions or the correct inferences in this case? Understanding traffic signs is a huge problem for us. This is a simple image that has a, you know, a large number of traffic signs. How do we sort them out correctly so that we can guide the users as they are driving on these freeways? Additional challenges for us are occlusion. Often signs might be occluded because of trees, because of snow, et cetera. And we have to make the best of it given the real world situation. The other important source of imagery is overhead imagery, primarily taken with satellites, but sometimes even with low, low flying aircraft. And here are the different sources, right? As I mentioned, low flying aircraft all the way to satellite imagery. The low flying aircraft are able to give us very high resolution imagery and the resolution increases in coarseness as we go to different satellites that are available. High resolution imagery is available for nearly 98% of the world's population. And in fact, one of the big challenges that we face here is that depending on when the satellite goes around, we might have the cloud layer. The teams at Google have developed interesting algorithms that allow you to subtract the cloud layer and actually get a representation of what the terrain below looks like. We have many applications of the satellite imagery from things like detecting roads. So using this overhead imagery, we identify road segments. We can tell what is the road type, whether this is a paved road or an unpaved road. We can model intersections and then connect all of these things to a road graph. 
Here is an interesting example. So the map that you see, this particular one, was the original map. We looked at the overhead imagery, and you can see that there is actually a township there. And then algorithmically, we've identified the entire road network that represents that township and connected it to the main highway that was existing on the map. So that's how we have been able to add a lot of roads worldwide. Information about the virtual world is also important for location-based games. If we can do very interesting 3D modeling of the buildings, then that gives a realistic playground for these virtual games. Drawing buildings is yet another application of the satellite imagery. And this is an example where the buildings have been perfectly identified and including some of the non-traditional shapes, as you can see. But this is a challenging problem. Even with the best of the algorithms, sometimes we are not able to completely identify all of the buildings. Here is an example of a dense urban area where it is very challenging. The roofs that are marked in green are the ones that were detected, but a trained human can easily see that there are a lot of other houses that have not been detected yet. And this is what keeps our job interesting and motivating. How can we continuously improve the techniques and the algorithms that we have to do better and in turn help our users? In addition to these, Commonly available use cases, we have a lot of interesting emerging use cases. Google Maps has been used extensively for sustainability and social impact, for crisis response, for assistive driving and self-driving vehicles, ride sharing and delivery services, on location gaming, and augmented reality. I'll try to give you a sneak peek at some of these applications in the next few slides. Social impact with maps technology, this is again something that I feel very passionate about. We have over a billion people in the world who do not have canonical addresses. And if you do not have a canonical address, then it becomes extremely difficult for you to obtain ID cards or you know, have the right to vote, get mail or packages delivered to your doorfront, open bank accounts, get health services, and the list of challenges is endless. One of the things that Google has done is develop this technique called plus codes. And what they do is they help you to identify individual places very accurately in this world. And here is an example of a plus code of a location in Kuala Lumpur, you know, the 5P, 56 plus 4Q. But this is easily geocoded and recognizable in Google Maps. By the way, just so that you know, there are other technologies like this. You may know of what three words, which tries to do something similar, right? It divides the entire world into a grid of very small areas, and each area is labeled using three words. That allows you to identify that as an address or a location. As I mentioned, these plus codes work in Google Maps and can be extremely helpful in areas where standard addresses are not available. Google Maps partners with city governments and local authorities and has developed an environmental insights explorer. It identifies a lot of interesting, actionable information about environmental impact. Things like carbon emissions, you know, number of cars, and so on. And this was presented at a global climate summit. With the help of this information, local governments can start taking action in terms of policy and social change. So we can identify not only you know, the amount of pollution or the carbon, but also what is the energy offset potential based on the solar capabilities, right? If we have identified the roofs that can have solar panels mounted on them, it becomes an interesting challenge to see how much of the carbon emissions can be offset using energy derived from natural sources. Crisis response. We've identified that during the COVID-19 times, it was extremely important for our users 
for emergency response professionals to find out areas where there are COVID-19 cases, to identify shelters, and now things like, where can I get the vaccine? This helps our users to make informed decisions. We are constantly working behind the scenes to identify the right sources of data and make them available in a consumable way to our end users. We've also published community mobility reports. Uh, these are available um, on you know, the Google website. It identified changes in visit patterns during the COVID-19 pandemic. Things like, what is the impact on retail? What happened to parks and other open areas? And what happened to transit? Right? And we can clearly see significant changes in mobility due to the COVID. I live in the Bay Area in California. And as you may have heard, we often are impacted by wildfires. And there are a lot of agencies that have developed these crisis maps that provide us with near real-time information of where the fires might be, how they are spreading, and more importantly, for people who are affected by fires, information about shelters, information about routes that might be open or closed, especially when you have mass evacuation going on. Right? There tends to be a lot of traffic on the roads. And we want to make sure that we are providing information about temporary closures and other things very quickly to our users. Here is an example of uh, Hurricane Harvey. This is a before and after picture uh, taken use, using the satellite images. So this is before and here is after. And you can see the destruction. Right? The before picture shows you all of the houses. The after shows you the destruction. And as I mentioned before, whenever these natural disasters hit, it becomes extremely important for initiatives at Google Maps to help our users find their way out, find emergency response shelters, and so on. A few thoughts about looking ahead. Augmented reality, I'm sure you have heard about augmented reality and virtual reality that's really capturing the imagination of a lot of the younger generation. We are experimenting with it. And what we want to do is to annotate the world around us with useful information. So think about this. If we wanted to do walking navigation right, in crowded places, uh, you know, big cities like Mumbai or New York, and if we can get real-time information based on what your camera is seeing, then it makes the directions extremely accurate and easy to follow. And more importantly, we can even gamify this a little bit and have things like guiding animals that lead us along the path. That makes it a lot more fun and engaging for our users. We are also constantly working on building richer maps. And I know that this image might be a little bit hard to see. What you are seeing on the left is the original Google map. And on the right is something that we have released in you know, a few areas, or we are experimenting in a few areas where we have built richer maps. Right? These things include sidewalks, crosswalks, road widths, and pedestrian islands. With the desire to continuously help our users navigate and get to their destinations safely and in time. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I want to end with an acknowledgement. You know, I've had a chance to present here to the VJTI students and faculty. But this is a work done by a lot of teams across Google. And I've really had the privilege of working with some of the smartest people in the world. And so I want to say a big thank you to all my colleagues and fellow engineers at Google who have made this place fun and exciting. So I'll stop here. And I'm happy to take questions. Wonderful, Rajesh. This is a really wonderful talk. Really, really wonderful presentation. Applaud. Thank you so much. Chance, you might be yeah. muted. Okay. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful lecture. This will definitely give us a prodigious insight into the field. Let's move on to the final segment of this evening.
the question and answer session. We have with us here a young enthusiast from the first year, Vivek Patel. Over to you, Vivek. Hello. Hello, sir. I will be proceeding with the question and answer section. And my first question to you is, after getting admission into VJTI and before getting into Google, which decision do you think in terms of advancing your career did you make? Was the most consequential one? Um, a wonderful question. I will say there were many things that helped. And I will also say that in hindsight, some of the decisions proved to be extremely valuable. I don't think that these things were necessarily very well planned or scripted. I will be honest with you. As I told you earlier, uh, as I was going through my PhD program, I thought I will uh, take up a faculty position. I absolutely love teaching. So, um, you know, that is where my passion was. But I will say the thing that made a lot of difference in terms of my professional career and, and got me into the applied research field was the decision to pursue machine learning. Now, the time when I um, you know, pursued machine learning as my major area of focus was the time when machine learning was exciting, but still a lot more academic. And it so happened that in the late 90s, the internet you know, started taking off, right? And so just very, very fortuitous. And then companies like Yahoo and others started collecting lots and lots of interesting data that needed to be analyzed. And it was very clear that this analysis cannot be done by humans alone. And machine learning algorithms and techniques started being applied to this. And it so happened that I was at the right place at the right time. And that got me uh, to an industrial research lab at Allstate and then to Blue Martini and Yahoo. And I feel one of the few privileged people who has actually been able to use what I studied um, in my graduate school throughout my professional career. I'm, of course, learning a lot of new things as we go along. But that is probably one decision that was extremely influential. So that is truly insightful. Um, sir, according to you, what was the best thing you did, uh, did in your college times at VJTI and that you think everyone should do to get an edge over the global competition? So I would say a few things. Um, there are a lot of interesting things that you do. Um, you know, make sure that we as students stay curious and excited. Um, there are so many interesting things that we can learn. Right? Whether it is from social events, I still remember you know, Pratibim and the other events um, that were organized at VJTI. Even the flower show, and I don't know if they still organize that, but you know that was a very important event at BJTI. And these were things that were outside of the main discipline, but gave you very interesting perspectives. So while I cannot point to a single thing, I would say being curious and being open-minded is going to be extremely important as you go through your undergraduate education and find out what you're passionate about. That will help you in your professional careers ahead. Of course, as you are going through your college education, you're making sure that you master the fundamentals, all of the fundamental courses in mathematics and physics, et cetera, doing well in those, and then pick your discipline, your area of interest, and go deep in it. That is one other piece that I feel is extremely helpful. So having one area of depth and then a good knowledge of the fundamentals helps you to tackle newer problems and newer challenges that will come by. As you are all aware, the world around us is changing dramatically. Right? When I went through VJTI, we did not have the internet. You know, we were working on the x86 computers, um, you know, 640K of RAM. And then the world has evolved since. But VJTI has given me the ability to adapt to the real world situations and the skills to learn new things that come along. 
So I think that's definitely something I'll keep in mind. Now I am passing it back to Shreyansh. Thank you, Vivek. Now we have a few questions from the live chat box here. So, sure. so the question number one is: We can clearly see that machine learning is becoming an important skill to require acquire. What inspired you to machine learning, and when did you start learning it? Yeah, <laughs> wonderful question. I will again say that this was a, a bit accidental. I graduated from BJTI, and I came to Iowa State University in Ames with the desire to do uh, high-performance computing. And uh, Professor Darwala will remember that my project during the VJTI days was on um, distributed computing. And, and that is the area that I wanted to study. Now, in my first semester in the master's program, I took an artificial intelligence course uh, with uh, Professor Vasant Honawar, who eventually became my advisor as well. And I was so fascinated by AI that I decided to switch areas. And instead of going into high performance computing, I studied AI. And you know, as part of the AI curriculum, I took several machine learning courses. And, and that's how um, you know, I completed my master's and PhD in that area. So very much an accident of nature, but looking back, uh, perhaps one of the best things that happened. Thank you, so that was really amazing. Okay. So the second question is, what do you think about the future and importance of data science? Will it take us to a new height into the coming future? Absolutely. I, I think data science is an amazing field. Um, it opens up a lot of opportunities in a variety of disciplines, whether it is retail, whether it is healthcare in medicine, whether it is the environment. The ability to analyze large volumes of data and synthesize the information to come up with the right insights that then help us to take appropriate action isn't just fascinating. I know several magazines and reports have called data science as the greatest job in the 21st century. I'm sure there are a lot of other jobs that are also very fascinating. But what data science allows you to do is apply your critical thinking skills to these various applications. And so assuming that you are interested, I absolutely feel that that is a fascinating area that you should continue to focus on. Thank you, so that was quite fascinating. Uh, my question is, is there any suggestion that you want to give to the upcoming generation of engineers? Like what should they start with? Or... Yeah. Um, I already mentioned a few things. Um, we are doing extremely well in our academics. Um, for the 21st century, it is extremely important to be well-rounded. Communication, collaboration, creative thinking, these are very important skills. As I have showed you a little bit, even at Google, we are working closely with teams. And it is the collaboration and the strong communication that we have, the ability to tell your story, the ability to translate the knowledge that you have gained into action is extremely crucial. So in addition to your academic rigors, I want all of you to think about these other skills. And sometimes these skills are not emphasized enough in our engineering education. And, and there, there are very good reasons for this. You know, we have to cover a certain curriculum. There is four, four years of rigorous curriculum that we as students have to go through. But something that I urge both the students to think about, as well as the faculty members who are listening to this talk. Thank you, sir. That was very interesting. Now, moving on. So the next question is, how much weightage is given to satellite imaging in uh, making of road networks compared to crowdsourcing? Yeah, uh, this is a very nice question. What I will say is, in a lot of these cases where we are extracting information, we try to extract information from multiple sources. So it is less about giving weightage to one source versus the other, but you think of this as a quiver full of arrows, right? And we use these different arrows that help us to get information that allows us to corroborate other sources, right? And we want to make sure that the information is accurate. 
So in some cases where satellite imagery is available, we might use it to bootstrap the road network, but then crowdsource information or information from our human experts allows us to connect the road networks, let's say to major highways and other things. So what we think about is how do we start from the end user problem, which is to try and provide an accurate road network for navigation, and then work backwards to identify what are the data sources that we have available and how might we effectively combine them. Thank you, sir. The next question, uh, what is your take on the current bloom in the IT industry and how much do you think it will improve in the upcoming future? Did you say current boom? Is that the question? Yeah. Yes, sir. The current bloom in the IT industry. Yeah. Um, the IT industry has blossomed over the last several decades because of all of the advances, you know, in computing, right? Who could have imagined that right now, you know, a simple mobile phone would be a lot more powerful than the computers that we used, uh, you know, when I was a student at BJTI. Uh, this is going to continue to increase um, over time. I feel what is important is also the applications of computing technology, whether it is machine learning, computer vision, or you know, distributed systems, augmented reality, et cetera, in a variety of other applications, right? Are we able to transform medicine? Are we able to assist with environmental insights and solving some of the most challenging environmental problems? And so as you are thinking about this, Clearly, there are a lot of applications in IT, but there are a lot of other applications where people who are experts in those fields might be able to col collaborate with you to solve some very interesting problems. And I feel that over the next 20 to 30 years, it is that type of collaborative problem solving which will be very well regarded and which will be the future in some sense. Uh, that's a great outlook, sir. Our last question for today's evening is, apart from being excellent at what the job demands of you, what should we keep in mind to climb up the corporate ladder? Um, a, a good question. I can see where it is coming from. Um, you know, again, I must say, I would encourage... Let me, let me put it this way. It, it is very important for all of you as students to think about your career and the advances in the career. You know, that is extremely crucial. I would encourage though, to not make rising up in the corporate ladder, a career obsession. If we can make problem solving or being excellent at the work that we are doing, our main obsession and passion, you know, the promotions, the, um, you know, corporate laurels, et cetera, will all come. Uh, it is important to keep thinking about the career and the career progression, no doubt about it. But I do hope that as students and as the younger generation of uh, people in the workforce, we realize that it is not just about getting the next promotion, but it is about solving interesting problems and being passionate about it. Thank you. So actually, we have one more question. Uh, can, sure. can you give an insight on how can people from non-software core branches like electronics, textile, mechanical be a part of Google projects like Google Jackpot Smart Jacket project? Yeah, uh, wonderful question. Right? Um, Google does hire a lot of engineers as well. As you can imagine, you know, um, there are a variety of advances that are happening in hardware, uh, you know, advances that are happening in augmented reality and in robotics and so on. And so there are several areas where people from other disciplines are also welcome, right? As we think about data centers, as we think about, you know, power consumption in those data centers. Um, these are areas where engineering disciplines that are outside of computing can also make uh, very significant. Thank you, sir, for your duly exhilarating words. We hope you all enjoyed the session. I'm Shreyan Sharma signing off. Until next time, this is Techno Vanza VJTI. Thank you.